Welcome to our worship training sessions in Gordon Presbytery. My name is Heather Michelson, and I am hosting these sessions on behalf of the Mission and Discipleship Committee. Session five is entitled Worship Training, Families and Fresh Expressions, and was facilitated by Ms. Vicki Stickett and recorded on 28th June, 2022. Vicki works with us here in Gordon Presbytery as our youth facilitator and has a passion to see fresh expressions established in our area and to help congregations make room for children and families in worship. If you would like the handouts which correspond with this session, please be in contact with me through the email below. Thank you for joining us online or in person as we learn together. This is our last session together for the summer, but we will be back together this autumn to share more with you about certification and possible next steps. We will let you know a date after the summer holidays. It's been a joy to learn together. So we're gonna be talking tonight about including children in worship and a bit about fresh expressions. Now that's a big topic area, so it's going to be a bit of a whistle-stop tour. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to get some ideas to get you started, and I'll point you towards some resources and some places that you can find out more um, if this is something that really captures your interest. Okay? And so the reason I put out things on your tables to play with at the start is because play is really serious business for children. Um, it's how they learn. It's how they find out about the world. It's how they practice all those skills that they're going to use in their everyday life. Anyone that's had a small children in their vicinity for any length of time knows that play is really, really, really important. But you know what? It's not just children that play is important for, I think. I think that as grown-ups, actually, we need to play as well because we all learn and we all experience life in different ways. And actually, we can see church as a way of playing through and rehearsing the skills and the experiences of our faith that we can then take out and play out and live out in our everyday lives. So church can be playful and it can be fun. And that's all right. You're allowed to have fun in church. Is that a revelation? <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, some of the things I'm going to say tonight might the difference, the things that other people have told you on other nights. I've only managed to make it to one of these sessions. So while I know that they've been good and I've been getting lots of feedback about how much people have got out of it, I don't really know what was said. Now, it's, I'm quite all right if I disagree with what somebody said earlier. It doesn't mean that they're wrong and I'm right or that I'm wrong and they're right. It might just mean that we've got a bit of a difference in emphasis and priority. Okay, And sometimes that tension, that difference, is where creativity can blossom. You know, we're looking at the community that's in front of us and thinking, what worked for this community, not the ideal community that we learned about uh, back in June? What is it that's going to capture these people's imagination that's going to help these people engage with God, whether they're two and are trying to climb the pulpit, or whether they're 80 and are thinking, what on earth is going on? <laughs> okay, So hopefully we're going to be thinking about things that work. We're not going, I'm not going to be suggesting that every service in church has to be a complete circus. Okay? When I'm talking about intergenerational work and involving children and young people and including them, I'm talking about things that hopefully will be engaging for the whole community and everyone that's there. Because we know that adults learn in lots of different ways, just like children learn in lots of different ways. So hopefully some of these different creative Ideas using play, using different activities, different resources, just sometimes different approaches will be helpful to everybody. Sounds good? Lovely. Right, somewhere on your tables, buried under bubbles and Lego and everything else that you've brought with you, there's hopefully a set of questions. Well, there's set, several sets of questions. You're going to be talking an awful lot to each other tonight. So if you can find set of questions number one, I've lost them myself. Here we go. These are all questions about your experience of being a child in church and taking children to things. So you should have, uh, can you think about a time when you were apprehensive about going to something that you thought would be more geared towards adults and what was it, what was it like when you got there? Uh, what clues does a place or an event give you that children are welcome and expected? 
what do you think a child or their parents and carers would think about your church if they came and joined you for worship? And then the one that I'm going to take feedback on at the end in about 10 minutes' time is what clues can we give children and families that they are welcome, expected and included when they come to our church services? Okay, so four things to think about, one of which I'm going to take some feedback on. You've got 10 minutes. Off you go. get in your what clues can you give children young people and families in your church that they're welcome and expected and going to be included what sort of things did you come up with okay so activity bags lovely so things that are there that children can do and pick up and play with and engage with in the service lovely it's a really good idea uh, yeah it's a lovely idea having those things visible and out with the expectation that children might well be there lovely has anyone got any ideas about how you might do that Notice board, that could be a good one. Um, if you're me, you're not going to go and look at a notice board. Your first port of call is actually going to be the church website, church Facebook group, that sort of thing. I know it's maybe not always the most natural thing for a church to do, um, but actually for children and families, for younger folks, maybe a little bit of thought going into that can be really, really helpful because that is the first place that I go and look if I'm going somewhere new. That and Google Maps so I can see it on the, on the street view and I know where I'm going. Super helpful. Uh, really helpful if you've got pictures there that show you that what your church is like. Um, if you've got children with additional support needs, um, having a photo that shows what the space they're going to be into can be really, really helpful because um, there can be quite a lot of anxiety about going into a new space and not knowing what's expected of you. Um, and that is just one of those little things that people find um, just really helps. Yeah. Anything else that you might do? Yeah, having people that are good at welcoming and empowered to go and do that can be really good. Now, those people might not be adults. Um, I think one of the best welcomers that we have had at Pitt Methon Church was about seven years old at the time and just loved people, really loves people and was fantastic about going up to you and she'd have your life story out of you in about three seconds flat because you can't say no to a seven-year-old. Um, but it was really good about welcoming people and making sure that they were included, whether you wanted to be or not, really. Anything else? Yeah, speaking to children, speaking on their level can be really helpful um, and making sure that you say hello to them as well as their parents. More biscuits, even. More biscuits. I mean, I'm in full agreement with that, yeah. Um, yeah, food and drink and having things there that children like. Um, children don't tend to be going for the tea and coffee, um, so maybe having juice. But also having a chat with your parents about what is it that they feed their children for snack because... Um, I'm certainly seeing some families now who are maybe a little bit more cautious about biscuits um, and maybe the children are getting fruit as a snack and, and water and that's just kind of what they expect, um, which is, we feel like we're giving them a real treat when we give them a biscuit, but maybe that's just something to check. Yeah, music can be really good. Um, I'm not really going to talk too much about music tonight because I know that's been covered elsewhere, but yeah, using music that maybe children and families are listening to, have a chat with them about you know, what CDs do they have in the car. Uh, There's a whole world of Christian children's music that's moved on a long way from Be Bold, Be Strong. Um, some of it is even actually quite enjoyable. It's great. Uh, so, you know, go and have a look at some of that. Um, Nick and Becky Drake are doing some really good things. Ren Collective Kids. Um, you know, they're all things that your families might well be listening to. If they're on in the background, it gives them, like, oh, I know this, it's familiar. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, involving them if they are there. And again, it can be tricky if, you, if maybe they're not a regular part of your worship service because you kind of almost have to have it in the back of your mind to include that. If they're there every week, then absolutely do have that in your mind. How are children going to be included and involved in this service? And it might be simple things like if you're passing the collection plate, I know we're not doing that so much at the moment, um, the adults put their money in. What could kids put in? Could they offer their drawings and their creative skills? And could that be a thing that they do? Um, I've seen that work really well. You know, it can be little things, and it might be things that just are quirky for your church, and that's absolutely fine. Um, yeah, anything else? 
Really good question. What do you do when it's causing challenges having the children there and people are maybe a little bit moany and maybe there's some, there are some issues. The classic one being noise and not being able to hear. Um, one of the answers that I to do just what we're trying to do tonight and use your technology, use your microphones and really encourage the people that are speaking to be using a mic rather than just standing up because they're only you know, speaking for two minutes and everyone knows what they're saying anyway. Get them to use a mic. Um, and you can outcompete your child. Um, that can be really helpful. Um, if there's issues because the children are noisy and because they're, they're restless and they're bored, maybe we need to be doing, thinking about actually how do we engage them in the service. Why are they bored? What's, how, why are we not kind of getting them involved in what's going on? Why is this not exciting to them? And um, is it that we need to have somebody who's good at this sitting alongside the parent and helping the parent to show them how to engage that child in the act of worship. Because if a parent's new to church as well, actually they might be struggling a little bit themselves to go, what is going on and what's expected of me? And oh my goodness, why did they all go quiet? Um, so leading people through the service a little bit can really be helpful. Um, some people are better at that than others. Some people are about as subtle as a sledgehammer. So you know, choose your people wisely if you're going to take that approach. Um, and sometimes it's, um, I've seen a church where it was, they had a stone floor, and so children running around were very, very echoey, um, and that was really, really irritating. Um, they had a group of old ladies knit socks in, you know, big, thick, woolly socks, lots of colours, um, garish as you like, and that was just the thing, that children coming through the door would be offered a pair of socks. I think they were washed occasionally. <laughs> and encouraged to swap their, their shoes, particularly if they're in clacky summer sandals, for a nice pair of socks and they could run around to their heart's content and the noise was you know, reduced. So, you know, it can be creative things like that and um, can help. But yeah, I would address it if, if that's becoming an issue. Um, and sometimes it might be having to say to people that are moaning that if they want children there, they've got to be able to put up with a little bit of noise and disruption sometimes. And that sometimes the price you pay for that gathered community of worship is that it's not always as tidy as you might like. And that can be a difficult conversation to have too, but it is worth doing the awkward sometimes and nicely if you can. Everyone's going, oh my goodness, I hope that's not what I have to do. <laughs> and that's probably an approach to take as a whole church, not just an individual, um, to agree as a whole church. What is it that we're going to do that's going to help children and families know that this is a place where they are absolutely welcomed, and how are we going to look after everybody along the road to doing that? Any other ideas? Already? Yeah, so having some services that are maybe particularly geared towards children throughout the year, um, where you're going to tolerate the higher noise levels, the higher chaos levels, um, and doing things a bit differently can be really helpful. Um, having some places where actually you know that it's going to be less tidy than others can be great. I love Chris Dingle. Um, it's the most dangerous service you can do. Children and fire and sweets. <laughs> um, it's great. I have watched a child with a lit orange um, trying to eat the sweets with the candle and long hair, and the parent just completely oblivious because they were in church and it was all safe. Like, oh my goodness. Um, no children were harmed, but quite. Great. So lovely. We've got loads of different ideas then about how do we include our children and families, how do we show them that they're welcome. Um, and yeah, I'd encourage you to go away and think about your particular church community. Uh, what is it that you could do as a church community that would show children and families that they're welcome there? Um, it might be big things, it might be little things, but it's always a good place to start. So once you've got children and families in the service, whether they've turned up and you know they're coming or whether they're an unexpected surprise visitor, um, what are we going to do in our services? Um, to engage children and young people so that they're not necessarily getting bored and restless in the same way that they might um, if they just come in and think, oh my goodness, what's going on? Is this for me? No, it's not. I'm going to go and colour in the corner and cause a bit of chaos. One of the first things that you're going to get to do in a service is we're going to share the Bible. A lot of the Bible stories that we share are stories, aren't they? And I've not met a grown-up that doesn't like a story certainly not met a child that doesn't like a story. So one of the things that we can do is really make the most of our storytelling. And that might be, there's lots of different ways that we might try that. One of which would be, when we're telling stories, can we use props? Can we use things that are going to help us 
to tell this story. I don't know whether any of you had a go at telling Noah's Ark with this. I particularly like this set because I've actually got two Mrs. Noah's rather than Mr. and Mr. So I might use this. Um, someone was talking to me last time I came about godly play. Um, that's a particular way of telling stories that can be used with groups of children, it can be used in school, it's sometimes used with adults as well, that tells the Bible story in a particular way with questions and space for wondering. So that can be a fantastic way to tell a story, to use props. And I'd encourage you, if you have children in your service and you've used a prop, you've used something to tell that story, to then leave that in a space where the children are because they might well want to continue playing through that story. Um, it might end up being a bit of a mashup of Noah's Ark and Spider-Man, but actually they're thinking through what was that story and what did it mean for me? What does it mean for the world that I live in? Um, and that can be a really good thing to do. Um, another thing that you might want to think about is using drama, using storytelling techniques. Can you have lots of different voices involved in telling stories? Um, in stories where you've got lots of characters, can you involve different people in the congregation? Some of whom might be children. Um, can you think about creative ways that you can show people that this is an important part of the service? If you're reading one of the letters from Paul, how do you show people that this is a letter? That this is something that is written to a community? Um, how do you help people understand that context? That can be something simple as if you're going to read a letter, put, put a table at the front of church and have whoever's reading that sat down at the table with a pen in their hand as if they're writing. Suddenly it takes on a different context. You've shown people something more about that book. You've intrigued them. So what's going on? Why are they writing a letter? Who are they writing to? Little things like that can make a big difference. Making sure that you lead people through the service. So it's not, sometimes I see um, churches where it's sort of, Everything happens because we know what we're doing, don't we? Um, and somebody gets up to read, and it's just another voice. Um, and if you've got a child that's not really paying attention in the corner, uh, um, they're going to ignore that. But sometimes making the most of those changes in dynamics. And saying, right, we're going to read the Bible together. Um, if you're telling stories with props, or maybe with a book, you might want to gather the children in front of you, if they're amenable to that, just to show them that this is a bit of a different part of the service. Uh, but you might want to use things like children's Bibles occasionally, your children's storybooks to tell some of the stories. They tell the same Bible stories, but in a slightly different way. That can be quite a nice way to tell a story. But we don't always want to only be using children's Bible stories, because the, the whole Bible is for all children. Sometimes it just means thinking creatively about how we use the things we're already doing um, to include children and young people. That one's another favourite, actually. Have you come across Renita Boyle? And tell it together tales. She's worth looking up. She's a Scottish, well, no, she lives in Scotland. She's an American lady, and um, she's a very good storyteller. She takes a lot of Bible stories and um, has creative retellings of them. So if you're feeling a little bit dramatic, um, she's a good person to get hold of. And use her. Just different creative ways of sharing the Bible. And once we've done our Bible reading, we want to help people to then think about what was in that reading. What's in that that we're going to learn from today? So on your tables, as you, well, as you came in, you got a sheet with different spiritual styles on it. Has anyone come across this spiritual styles stuff before? Yeah, getting a few nods, a few shakes of heads. Some have, some haven't. That's good. Uh, it's always nice to start with a little bit of knowledge. So spiritual styles are a thing that um, Roots particularly use. They produce lectionary-based resources. Um, for churches to use. They're really good, really like them. I think Spill the Beans use them sometimes as well. Um, and they're just different. They're a way that they've thought about saying, actually, everybody learns in different ways. But our churches are quite word-based, aren't they? We preach, we read the Bible, we pray, but we're often using words. And that's fantastic for some people. Some people are really wordy. Um, even some children are very word-based. There are always some children who love to follow along with the story in the Bible. They are very, very thinky. They're probably the kid that's coming up with 101 difficult questions. They really want the knowledge. Okay? There are probably some children like that in your churches because church quite suits those sorts of children. However, it's not the only way that we learn. Um, some people learn in a very emotional way. 
they are very, they're often very, very keen on the arts. They love the music. They're probably really enjoying sim singing hymns together or poetry or looking at artwork, pictures and sculpture. Some people are very emotion driven. Um, some people are very action based. If they're going to make sense of something, they have to do something. Um, if they've heard about um, an earthquake abroad, they know that God is concerned about those people. And to make sense of that, they need to do something to help those people. They want to raise money. They're going to want to um, have a cake, a cake stand at the next church service so they can raise some money and send it off because they know that God loves those people. God didn't want that disaster to happen and they need to do something. They are activists. They are action-based. Uh, maybe they've been learning about the story of Noah and creation and the flood. They know that God will never flood the world again and God loves the world. They want to go out and do a litter pick and take care of it. They're your activists. They're always on the go. They're often um, not particularly good at following the rules, as we said. They might be the ones who are causing a bit of chaos at the back of church. We love them. They're great. And you have some people who are very symbol-driven. They like mystery. They're quite happy with the unanswered questions. They like the things that they have to really think about and work out. Um, they might like times of silence. Um, they like the things that are a bit untidy and messy. They like to be able to reflect and have that time and space in their service. Even children like some times of silence. Um, I, brought, I was trying to think of some symbol-based things that we could have. And here's one that I had in a secondary school last week. Um, we were thinking, I was invited in for diversity week. And so we have um, a loom and we're thinking about who, um, who are we and who's our community and how do we weave into that. And for some young people, that was absolutely what they wanted to do. They could see themselves being woven into this diverse community in their school. Okay, so sometimes symbol also requires action. And these people probably really enjoy things like communion and liturgy. They like having those symbols of our faith. Some of you are probably seeing yourself in there. The lectionary reading from this Sunday, which is from Luke 10. You've got verses 1 to 10 and then 16 to 20. We skip the bit in the middle because it's awkward. So I'm going to, if you've not got it on your tables, I will give you it out. I think I put it there. And I want you to take um, about 15 or so minutes in your table groups to have a look at that lectionary reading, have a think about what it's saying and what you might want to learn from it, and then see if you can come up with different elements in a service that use those four spiritual styles of word, action, symbol, and emotion um, to help different people engage with that Bible story and learn something from it. Does that make sense? No one's looking too confused. So I'll give you about 15 minutes to do that and then we'll see what you come up with. Luke 10. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move away from that house to house. Whenever you enter into a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there. And say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off and protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. 
Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is our reading and word of the Lord for today. Um, while you were having your break, I put on each of your tables a case study about fresh expressions. They are particular communities. Um, they're from all sorts of random places. To be honest, the Fresh Expressions website is brilliant. I'm going to send you a link to it. It's worth going and looking at. But all of their stuff is on YouTube, which is not very helpful in this hall. So you've got the ones I could find that were written down. Um, and so they're from all over. But have a quick look. Have a read through the case studies. They're talking about some very, very different communities doing very different, oh dear, um, with very different ways of approaching this idea of how do we do church differently to reach out, to be engaging to people that wouldn't usually come into a traditional church building. Um, now it's important to say fresh expressions of church are church in their own right. They're not a stepping stone to people coming into traditional churches. They are communities that are worshipping communities who are a church for themselves. Okay, um, So they're not trying to be something else, they're not trying to develop people into people who sit in pews. They are their own sort of form of worship. So have a read through this, and you've got some post-it notes on your tables, and I want you to have a think about what are things that excite you about this community and this way of working, and what are some things that maybe challenge you and that you find a bit difficult, that you're not quite sure about maybe. And then if you've got any questions, and they might be questions that you'd like to ask the organisers or the people that go, and they might just have to wonder about those, they might be questions that you'd like to ask God about this whole thing. Um, you can write those down as well. So I'll give you just five minutes, I think, because we're running a bit short on time.
think I could let this conversation go on a lot longer if we had more time, um, which is really good to see. So, does anyone have any post-it notes that you'd like to come and stick up here so we can see what questions we've got, what things we're finding challenging, and what things we're finding quite exciting about this idea of fresh expressions? So we've got some exciting things. We've got um, taking God to where people are. Uh, we've got food bringing people together. That's often a winner. Uh, we've got questions about rules and regulations and leaders and helpers and different roles within these new worshipping communities. Uh, we've got excitement about meeting young people where they are. You all had quite different case studies. Some were about young people. Some were, one was a messy church one. Um, there's a craft group one, a making group, and um, there's a couple of mountain pilgrims ones, um, groups that are looking at doing church outdoors, so, um, so they're all very, very different places. Um, what else? We've got challenges about being intentional in discussions. We've got challenges about who's going to do this? Who's going to be the people that initiate this? Where does it come from? How does it relate to a traditional church as well? How do we have these alongside each other? How do you stay on topic? <laughs> you had the mountain pilgrims one, didn't you? How do you manage to be intentional? How do you do this in a planned way? How do you create disciples? Moving from activity and chats to deeper spirituality. Uh, we've also got excitement about journeying together and being side by side. So we're only really touching on fresh expressions tonight in that they're a thing. Some people I know from the chat I was having going around saying, that's a thing, that's great, that's exactly what God has been calling us to do, and we just didn't have a name for it. Brilliant. Um, all power to you. Go and have a chat to your Kirk sessions, because everything must go through the Kirk session, um, and do some wondering and thinking about how this could look in your church community, in your um, wider community. Um, go and have a look at the Fresh Expressions website and... Yeah, if God is calling you to create a new worshipping community, um, go for it, I'd say. Um, um, rules and regulations, I am always a little bit um, creative with, and that's fine. Some of you are saying, what, this is a thing? Um, how does this work? How does it relate to church? You've got those big questions. Um, that's also fine. It's a new way of looking at things. Um, we've had chat, uh, quite a few questions about, well, what is messy church? Isn't messy church feeding into traditional church? And that's the place where I think quite a lot of our... Messy church is probably the thing that we've got in lots of places that's closest to being a fresh expression of church. And a lot of our messy churches are at, absolutely at this point of going, how are we not just an activity for children that the parents come along to, but actually how are we a discipling, worshipping community in our own right that's church just as much as Sunday morning church is church? So they're huge questions. There's lots of theology behind it. There's lots of thinking. There's lots of challenges. And there's not many neat answers. Some of you are going to be going, that's brilliant. We should definitely go and play there. And some of you are thinking, actually, that's maybe not where I'm called to be right now. And that's all right, too. It's always good to know that there's things out there and there's options. Um, and I think that's where we're going to leave it with the fresh expression stuff for this evening. Just that it's a thing. I'm going to send you some links out so you can find out more about it. Um, and yeah, I'd love to hear if you are inspired to do something.